Uh, thank you, uh, Danielle, for that introduction. I should mention that I'm one of the research directors at uh, IRPP. I manage the program on Canada's changing federal community, which is uh, quite relevant to uh, the topic of this conference. And before that, from 2010 to 15, I managed the research program on immigration, diversity, and integration. And as you may have guessed from my first intervention this morning, I haven't thrown that hat in the rubbish. I remain intensely interested in immigration issues, uh, not only here, but in, in Europe as well. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with Danielle and his team on the organization of this conference. Um, often when uh, another organization is listed as a partner, it doesn't mean much more than uh, a small donation in cash or in kind. Uh, in the case of this partnership, it really was one, and uh, it's been um, a really great experience. The, uh, the panel is on immigration and refugees, and um, someone who fell from the moon and just took a sort of quick crash course on Canadian federalism, might wonder, well, what does immigration have to do with federalism? Isn't it a, feder uh, isn't it a federal matter as it is in virtually all countries? Uh, uh, what do provinces and territories have to do with immigration? Well, uh, the answer to that is, they have had a power in this area for uh, 150 years. The 1867 Constitution has only two concurrent powers, shared powers, uh, agriculture and immigration. I've never looked into why provinces were given uh, uh, a role, a constitutional role in immigration in 1867. Uh, the federal government does have the last word if there's a conflict between laws at the provincial level and the federal. Uh, so uh, it's been there in the constitution, but it's only really since the 1970s that uh, we have seen uh, growing activism of provincial governments, starting with Quebec. Uh, there were four different agreements uh, culminating with the one in 1991, uh, which is uh, 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 a very interesting beast. Uh, I can talk a little bit more about it during questions if people want to know about its genesis and how it related to the Meechleg Accord. Um, and, uh, but starting in the late 1990s, other provinces became interested in having a role in um, selecting immigrants. This started in Manitoba. There was a shortage of, uh, yes, this is true, sewing machine operators. When the, I guess, the clothing trade was still fairly viable in downtown Winnipeg. Um, but over time, uh, the federal government has signed a, an agreement with all provinces and territories except for Nunavut. They're called provincial nominee programs, or some people are very careful and call them provincial and territorial nominee programs. And the important thing uh, as a result of this process of federalization, a term that Mireille Paquette has uh, used throughout her work, is that by uh, 2017, uh, one half of the principal immigrants in the economic category were selected by provincial or territorial governments. So uh, that's not only, that's not just a consultative role, that's a very, very practical role. The federal government can refuse a nominee for health or security reasons. It can also do that for the, the Quebec selected uh, immigrants, but there's only a very, very small number of cases each year that are rejected on those grounds. So uh, the provinces have acquired uh, a very important role in selecting Election, and over time also in the integration uh, and settlement policies, although the lion's share of those, and we'll be hearing from Debbie Douglas uh, later on, the lion's share of those are funded and managed out of the, the federal immigration department. So that's enough of my little historique, and the person who fell from the moon um, should be better informed. Uh, we're going to start with uh, uh, Robert Schertzer from the University of Toronto. Robert's areas of specialization are federalism, constitutional politics, and the management of diversity. I mentioned Mireille Paquette, who we uh, had on this panel until fairly recently. Mireille and Robert are working on an IRPP study, largely about the uh, 
irregular border crossers. I hope we're using the, going to use the same term. I hate it, but this is what we're we're um, referring to them as. And uh, after Robert, we'll hear from Debbie Douglas with a uh, more practical, on the ground. Uh, 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 set of observations, particularly about uh, the settlement of uh, refugees and also uh, asylum seekers. The the numbers of the of the asylum seekers, of course, have increased quite a, a bit in the last couple of years. Debbie is the executive director of the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants, and this is an umbrella body. Uh, I couldn't find how long, how many years you've been the executive director, but it's. Years. Tw about 20, okay. Uh, and uh, this is no uh, small uh, outfit because OCASI, as it's known, uh, groups together more than 220 member agencies uh, across Ontario uh, that deliver services of various kinds, uh, with language training being a, 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 an important one, but not the only one. So uh, on that, uh, over to you, uh, Robert. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Leslie, and thanks, Danielle, for the invitation. So, Leslie asked three important questions that were intended to frame our opening remarks. And I'm going to actually try and answer them instead of do what we normally do, which is completely ignore what the, the moderator asked us to do. No, so, no, yeah, yeah, exactly. I figured he would just throw things at me if I didn't do it anyways. <laughs> I'm going to try and directly answer each one in turn, but of course, I'll take a few detours and a few liberties. So, the first question is, Leslie asked, what's the most serious issue facing Canadian immigration policy today? So I think the answer is straightforward, a pretty serious one. It's the legitimacy of the entire immigration system. So, you know, we're one week removed uh, from uh, serious shootings, anti-Muslim uh, rising sentiment in, uh, in New Zealand. And this is happening in the context of rising ethno-nationalism across the globe, resurgence of right-wing extremism, uh, pretty serious surge in anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim sentiment across the world. And I think, you know, in Canada, we need to be really clear that we're not immune from these sentiments and from these uh, movements. And we can actually see, I think, the beginnings of the legitimacy of the immigration system in Canada increasingly being called into question by our political actors and by Canadians themselves. And we see this challenge taking place on a number of levels. We see it in increasing opposition to immigration levels across the country. So Angus Reid's been doing a poll for the last 40 years where they ask Canadians if they uh, accept or if they're against the number of immigrants that are coming into the country. And for the last 40 years, those numbers have hovered at around 40% of Canadians think immigration levels should go down. It goes up and down a little bit, but about 40% of Canadians think the levels are too high. In the last four years, the number of Canadians who feel that immigration levels should be dropped has risen from 36% to, in that same poll, 49%. Some polls last year put it as high as 57% of Canadians thinking that immigration levels were simply too high and needed to be reduced. So we're also seeing this challenge, the legitimacy of our immigration system, in how Canadians are increasingly viewing irregular border crossers or asylum seekers mm -hmm. crossing in into Quebec mm -hmm. through the U.S. border. So Angus Reid did another poll earlier this year that showed 67% of Canadians think that this border crossing is a crisis and that we've reached our limits in actually accepting asylum seekers. Same poll showed that six in 10 people said that we were being simply too generous to asylum seekers in Canada. And I think we're also really seeing this challenge the legitimacy of our immigration system in a shift in rhetoric, a slow shift in rhetoric about how immigration is increasingly being framed by actors as a threat to Canadian entity rather than as a core strength of our economy and our society. And this is beginning to creep into political discourse at both the federal and provincial levels. And this is a really dangerous game. In another study, so I have to wear another hat where I do nationalism studies, and I'm currently, like everybody else in the world, writing a book on Trump and Trump's use of ethno-national populism and actually the ways in which Trump frames immigration and frames the cultural conditions of America it's really a dangerous game to begin to enter into this territory. And we were talking about populism earlier. The ethno-national side of this is really dangerous, and we're starting to see signals of it in Canada. But if I go a step back and go, sorry, one level deeper here and try and answer the question, I think this threat to legitimacy of our immigration system is not the irregular border crossings, but rather how policy and political actors are responding to it and trying to manage that issue. And 
the significant uptick in crossers is actually driving a public perception that it's a problem. But what we're seeing with rhetoric around queue jumping or rhetoric around the securitization of this issue or a posture to be tougher on the border, these are all important responses that are sending signals to Gilets Jean and other groups that are mobilizing and seeing the paradigm opening up to engage in this kind of discourse. So I'm going to take a small detour here. I actually wrote the word detour. This raises an important question. So every time I talk about this issue, I find the first question that people raise is saying, is it a crisis? What's happening? What's the scope? Because there's a lot of debate about the numbers and a lot of discussion about what's actually happening. So I think it's incumbent on us uh, in the academy, but also political and um, policy actors to really recognize that irregular border crossings are, in the last two years, a significant and an extraordinary event in Canadian context. So over the last two years, there have been just over 40,000 asylum seekers who've crossed the border into Canada seeking asylum. 90% of these irregular crossings have happened at one place in Quebec. Uh, in August in 2017, 5,500 people crossed at the Roxham Road in one month. So these are pretty significant flows, right? Over the last 12 months, they've regularized a little bit. We get about 1,500 irregular border crossings uh, a month now over the last 12 months. And these have to be added. Part of the context and part of the difficulty here is kind of segmenting these different streams of migration flows into Canada. So these irregular asylum seekers have to be added to the regular resettlement that we do through our uh, um, resettlement programs and our refugee programs, as well as asylum seekers who present themselves at border crossings. In 2017, 50,000 uh, asylum seekers and, and refugees resettled into Canada. Last year, 55,000. These are very high numbers for Canada in our comparative context. In 2013, we only had 10,000 refugees and asylum seekers. So it's a pretty significant stop tick. But I also always say that's the one side. It is a bit extraordinary. It is something that's serious. But in 2001, we had 41,000 asylum seekers and refugees resettled to Canada. So it's not unprecedented levels. These aren't massive things we've never seen before. And in a global context, irregular asylum seekers crossing borders for Canada, it doesn't compare to some other countries in the world. And Canadians, someone said earlier, four people crossing into, uh, into Manitoba causes a crisis. Well, you should go and have a discussion with the Global South about migration flows and refugee camps. Okay? And so that's an important context, both in Canadian history and in our comparative context. This kind of gets into the other. The second question here, which is really I've started to answer in some of the IGR, Leslie asked, what has been the main impact of the arrival in Ontario of significant numbers of asylum seekers who've crossed into Quebec from the US? So I think really here, they're talking about the surge in asylum seekers and the border crossings has raised this political and policy stakes, right? And these challenges to legitimacy of our system. And I think the challenge that's been presented here, it's doing three things in our IGR world that we have to take really seriously. First, the asylum uptick has really exposed the weak points in our asylum system, right? And so there are considerable backlogs in processing asylum claims. There's right now 30,000 outstanding claims in front of the Immigration and Refugee Board to determine status of refugee. Those 30,000 are just for the irregular crossings. There's an, a total of 70,000 current claims in front of the IRB board to determine status. Those claims are taking about two years to process. And huge uh, capacity constraints for the system and massive amounts of money are needed in order to actually expedite these processes for both the system and for the humanitarian purposes of the migrants themselves. Now, I'll talk about in one second, the budget on Tuesday announced $1.2 billion to largely help address and card part this processing to try and beef up the capacity of IRB. That was where most of the money was going to be spent. Uh, but I'm going to talk about that in a second because it's also about some politics and some positioning. The second thing that the surge has done is exposed and exacerbated tensions between the federal and provincial governments and between provincial governments themselves on how to handle this issue. And I'm going to set aside the partisan politics for a second and just talk about the different interests at play here between Ottawa, Quebec City, and Toronto. So Trudeau has built his brand on supporting migration and pluralism. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about his tweet here that's been retweeted 400,000 times that says Canada is open to diversity and migrants. Every time this issue comes up, the opposition or any uh, critique will bring this up and say it's the reason we're having this problem. <laughs> okay. But on the other hand, this also has to be balanced with the federal government's objective to try and focus on protecting the integrity of the immigration system and dealing with the financial costs. And so this week, we saw the federal government pivot. We saw the Liberal Party pivot towards a stronger, tougher approach in the budget to 
uh, reinforcing the border, putting money into CBSA, a large, if you go below the fold in the budget, it's going to be going to CBSA largely for removal units, it looks like, to actually remove those who failed immigration status detention. Interestingly, in that budget, they didn't talk about the 300 additional million they're going to spend on the interim federal health program, which actually is to provide health support for these migrants while they're waiting status determination. Instead, they focused on more on border enforcement, on protecting Canadian integrity, and highlighting that they're going to talk about the Safe Third Country Agreement. We can come back to that later in Q&A because it's, it's a little bit difficult. Uh, so it's exacerbated this tension and the need for the federal government to kind of balance these two positions. Quebec uh, is in the process of, we talked about this morning a little bit, trying to reduce the number of migrants it admits and asking for changes to its accord behind, against all logic because they have a very good deal on funding right now. And also seeking to control these flows at Roxham Road because the point of access. So Ontario and Toronto are left dealing with many of the asylum seekers that are making their way to the GTA and trying, been trying to house and provide social services for those awaiting status determination is a really big draw uh, on the resources and the capacity of the area. Finally, the, the, what this surge has done is it's really exposed the lack of a common shared vision here between the federal and provincial governments. So what we basically have here is a field, as, as Leslie talked about, where in humanitarian immigration, asylum, family class, and refugee uh, immigration, the federal government's been the leader, been the lead policy uh, um, uh, role, and the provinces have had little substantive engagement in the policy decision-making process of this area. And the issue is that because of that gap, there's actually been a difficulty in reconciling all these positions and collaborating. And I'll end here on the final question that Leslie asked, which is, so if that's the case, why has the Ford government in Ontario refused to engage with the federal government on the settlement of asylum seekers? I think there's a really easy answer I can give in one line and then a more complex one. So I'll start with the easy answer. And the easy answer is politics, okay? It's a very easy kind of place uh, for a Ford to score political points against an opponent, mm -hmm. right? So here it mixes federal, provincial, fiscal, partisan politics all together in a nice bundle that allows Ford to use a wedge issue. Now, Ford is not Trump at all uh, in a lot of cases, but he can be tough on this issue to build his base, and he's doing that here. And I think this is interestingly from the IGR side, while we're seeing one of the reasons we're seeing Toronto emerge as an important uh, locus in this discussion, John Tory's been very good in bypassing Doug Ford, going directly to Ottawa, and saying that he needs money and support in order to actually deal with this inside the GTA. And I do think money's a driver here. So Ford is currently in the process of trying to find money that he promised he could find by never firing anyone or cutting anything, right? And so having to deal with an influx of individuals in Toronto who require social support is, an, is a challenge for him. So he's repeatedly said, I need $200 million in order to deal with this. John Tory has said that uh, Toronto needs another $64 million at minimum to deal with this. Uh, the Parliamentary Budget Office agrees with them and says these are really significant costs. Uh, and interestingly, again, in the budget on Tuesday, there was no mention of cash transfers to the provinces to deal with these costs. The federal government has noticed and, and given some indication it will do this, but it's not actually uh, committed anything of really substance in the most recent discussion. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the fact this is an aberration in federal provincial uh, relations and immigration, because traditionally it's an area of cooperation, and so this conflict is interesting, and we can pick that up later. Good. Well, um, someone can make up a question while we're uh, listening to Debbie or shortly after. So go ahead. Sorry, I wanted to say something. <laughs> I'll clap for you. Clap for you. <laughs> you can always clap for me. I just wanted to jump right in there and pick up where you left off. But I guess, but let me take a, a step back because I think it's important when I visit um, various places to acknowledge that we are uh, meeting on unceded Indigenous lands, um, where the Mohawk Nation is recognized as the custodians of these lands and waters. Um, I wanted to take a moment, though, to reflect that as an immigrant and refugee sector, um, we have just begun to even think about how it is that we engage in the conversation around reconciliation. And I thought it was um, apt that our panel is following um, the panel that talked about um, issues of reconciliation. I think for many of us in the sector, um, it wasn't until the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission calls to action that we really started to pay attention and that we have a responsibility um, as folks working with newcomers to Canada. Um, in particular, we've been paying attention to the call for action number 93 and 94, um, which deals with issues of newcomers and, and issues of the Citizenship Act and um, with, with very clear um, direction 
from, from, from the Commission um, asking the Canadian government to revise the information kit, for example, that newcomers receive, um, as well as its citizenship tests to more accurately reflect the history, uh, the histories of Indigenous peoples, including um, the history of residential schools, and um, in particular, to change the um, citizenship oath so that it now it will read that, um, and I quote, I, that I will faithfully observe the laws of Canada, including treaties with indigenous peoples and fulfill my duties as a Canadian citizen, which I, which I, which I, we absolutely support. Um, and as a council, part of our advocacy work with the federal government has been around the implementation of these things. And so we're pleased to say that um, the oath has been changed and a new citizenship guide will be coming out, um, hopefully in the next few months, um, that will more, um, but we'll have a more robust conversation about the role of Indigenous peoples um, here in Canada. And I think that today, today is also the International Day for the Elimination of um, Racial Discrimination. And here we are talking about issues of immigration um, and settlement and building inclusive and welcoming communities. And um, I think it's also an opportunity for us to affirm um, the sol working in solidarity with indigenous communities about um, issues of human rights, but also to recognize the role that racialized um, or in communities play here in Canada. And for me, as a black woman in particular, to look at the historical historical relationships of African Canadians um, and the Canadian government. Um, one of my colleagues and friend, um, human rights lawyer Anthony Morgan, um, has a brilliant article in the Ricochet Media this morning um, that talks about issues of reparations. And so my question is, is it time for us as Canadians to be talking about reparations in African Canadians and, uh, the, and the enslavement of African peoples here in Canada, which is, um, has been erased from our history. It was. Um, it, it resonated with me this morning when some, a couple of our um, panelists on the reconciliation panel talked about um, the erasure of indigenous histories, including the residential schools in our education system. Well, imagine how true that is in terms of Canada's relationship to the enslavement of the African peoples and the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so really glad to see new scholarship happening about it and increasingly a conversation um, happening um, here. I often say, you know, that black people didn't start arriving in Canada with the point system in, of 1968, and that we've been here for hundreds of years. And so um, I think that's part of the context when we talk about um, newcomers and immigration. But let me get to the questions that Leslie sent us. Um, and I'm going to try and follow it as much as possible. And the first question he asked was, what is the most pressing uh, issue for immigration and settlement um, in Ontario? And I have a number of things I wanted to talk about, but probably the, the largest political issue for us was the elimination of a dedicated ministry or minister responsible for immigration with this new government. Um, the election happened on June, I don't remember the date, um, but I woke up the next morning to find out that we no longer had a ministry, and not only didn't we have a ministry, we also didn't have not even a parliamentary assistant responsible for immigration in Canada's largest province that receives the largest number of immigrants, the largest number of refugees, the largest number of migrant workers, and the na largest number of international students. We were shocked. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we saw the breaking up of the various pieces um, of the ministry. So we have settlement and integration, which is key to the work that my, uh, my membership do, um, is, is now part of that super ministry of uh, children, community, and social services. Um, it's a $15 billion ministry, and our piece of that is um, fairly small. We saw the provincial nominee program that Leslie um, alluded to in his opening remarks that moved to economic development um, and things like the Fairness Commissioner's Office, um, which uh, plays a critical role in ensuring the recognition of credential, um, of international credentials, especially within with regulatory bodies, um, move to training colleges and universities along with GEO. Um, so, and, and no one really paying attention to if any of these pieces are working and how well they're working. Um, we were particularly concerned around the provincial nominee program. Um, surprisingly, Ontario, it wasn't until 20 15 that Ontario um, created its first immigration legislation and a, and a key part of that was a commitment to 5% francophone um, immigration. Well, whether or not we are meeting um, that threshold, nobody seems to know because we have nobody uh, monitoring or paying attention and so and getting answers over the last six months has been like um, pulling teeth. So I have lots to say about the politics of immigration in Ontario when we get uh, to our Q&A. 
But in terms of um, programming, eligibility criteria is probably one of the biggest concerns that we have. Um, the federal government, as you know, is the largest funder of immigrant and refugee services in Ontario and throughout um, Canada. Um, it's the Ontario region's budget from the feds is about $340 million per year. Um, as of last year, we anticipate that that will increase that now that we've tied settlement allocations to um, arrival numbers and Canada has just recently recently moved to multi-year um, planning, and so it gives us, as those of us on the ground, a better sense of being able to plan for services and what we can expect in terms of funding. Um, but, fun, but great to have $340 million in Ontario region, but federally funded services can only be accessed by permanent residents. That means that, conven at, uh, including convention refugees, um, that means that refugee claimants or asylum seekers, as we've now started to say in Canada, although our Immigration Act talks about them as claimants, um, citizens um, are not eligible, neither are migrant workers or international students. And I, I, I must say that international students now outpace permanent residents migrant and migrant workers in terms of their numbers uh, in, in Canada. Um, and I believe that they're going to be our major source of um, immigration given our two-step immigration um, process um, in the very near future. So it makes no sense um, that they don't have any access to um, federally funded services. The same is true for us, particularly around refugee claimants. Um, we know in any given year, at least 50% of those who apply for asylum are successful in some communities. It's as high as 80%. Um, I, one of the things that we've advocated with the federal government is when you look at like group like those applying under SOGI, sexual orientation and gender identity, we know that um, the acceptance rates are extremely high. We have folks who've been waiting for four, five, six years, um, and yet they're not able to access services. Um, it makes absolutely um, no sense. In Ontario, the government spends about $110 million per year on immigrant and refugee settlement, um, and that includes everything from adult ESL to interpretation services, particularly for women um, ex experiencing violence, um, immigrant employment programs, um, and regular settlement services. Uh, the program that funds the settlement services is a fairly small program called the Newcomer Settlement Program, which is about $10.5 million um, per year. Small, but critically important because it's based on needs and not on immigration status. And hence our concern that without um, a, a dedicated ministry or a dedicated minister, um, the indication seems to be that the province um, is, n is not interested or as interested as it should be in continuing to play the, ro the important role that it does in immigration and in immigration settlement. Um, I think the only thing we've heard from this new government in Ontario is that um, refugee claimants are not their business um, and they're not going to fund them, um, which raises great red flags for us given that they are currently funded um, under the Newcomer Settlement Program. Um, the sector, as I said, we have growing concerns around the future of um, settlement in, in Ontario. We've, we've attempted to um, have meetings with the minister um, uh, who is responsible for the settlement program with very little success. Um, she's met around the council, um, and we, we get why she's not keen to meet with us, but um, she's met many of our members, um, but very, with very little information. And so, in fact, we won't know although we are hearing rumors that we can anticipate a 4 to 5% cut to the $110 million, we really won't know until the provincial budget um, comes down in mid-April. Um, other program concerns that we have, uh, okay, sorry. Other program concerns that we have is around um, Section 91 of IRPA, um, where, well, it, when, when, when IRPA was first written, there was an unstated understanding that community-based community services will be able to support their clients on immigration matters. Um, with the previous government, when there was a re revision of the of IRPA in many cases, um, that was removed and only those who are a lawyer or a registered consultant or paralegal um, can now provide those kinds of services. 
um, our many of our member agencies in Ontario, but also across um, the country, um, have been challenged by IRCC as the major funder in terms of the kinds of supports that they're giving, which is creating um, significant problems for many of our clients on the ground. Um, agencies are basically being told that they risk losing their funds if their frontline workers are providing um, immigration services. We absolutely agree with the federal government that um, immigration advice should be provided by those with legal training, um, but that is not what we were doing. We were helping people to understand the various forms, which at any given time, whether or not um, you're English or French speaking, is difficult to understand. So you can imagine clients who don't have um, any of our official languages. Um, so, and many lawyers, um, because legal aid, especially in Ontario, is so limited, looked to organizations to do some of that front end work. And the fact that they're no longer able to do it is creating, as I said, um, great difficulties um, on the ground for our clients. Um, what's frustrating for us is that um, the previous Conservative government had uh, eliminated many of the immigration offices in some of the smaller centers um, in the province. And so when folks show up to immigration, they're actually referring them back to our agencies for that support. And then the other hand of citizenship to immigration in Canada is basically saying, well, no, it's too bad our immigration partners are referring people to you, but on the settlement side, you're not allowed to do it. So that inconsistency um, is, is, is unnecessary. I'm going to cross cross over all the stuff that I said that I was going to talk about. Um, let me talk about um, the irregular arrivals, and I'll, and I'll talk about some of the other issues during Q&A. And so the question was, um, what has been the response and the impact in Ontario of the irregular arrivals? We know that the majority crossed to Quebec um, after the first year when they were primarily Haitians. Um, they've been coming to Ontario. They've been primarily um, from West Africa, Nigerians, but also from Latin America, uh, who speak English as opposed to French. And what we've seen in a, in a phrase, a growing chorus of negative anti-refugee rhetoric and xenophobia. Um, and without a doubt, one of the biggest challenges has been the growing anti-refugee and the connected anti-immigrant sentiment um, combined with Islamophobia and, and anti-black racism. Um, we saw the difference when we saw an influx of when we brought in 40,000 Syrian refugees over a very short period of time, the Can Canadian public opened their arms, they reached out. We had folks complaining that the government weren't bringing in people fast enough. Come to the regular arrivals, difference in the folks who are coming in, and all of a sudden we have a crisis at the border that I was in um, Morocco at the end of December when Canada was one of 152 countries signing off on the Global Compact on Migration, and I could not believe the media coverage that was coming out of Canada, especially from our official opposition in terms of um, that this was a threat to our sovereignty, that our order was out of control. And I thought this is, a, you know, it's a non-binding, nice words kind of document that says that we'll all work together to, for regular migration and we will make sure that um, folks who are trying to reach safety or um, to cross borders are not exploited or um, trafficked. And, and, and that's basically all, all it says in that when people come into your country, you will make sure that your laws and applies to them, including your human rights, uh, and that they have human rights and, and, and those kinds of things. So it, it was the white nationalism that was coming out of that was um, shocking um, and continues to be shocking. And I think that as we head into the federal election, um, we are going to see, unfortunately, more of that. Um, I, I stay away from the language of populism. Um, I think that we need to name um, what is happening, which, which, is, uh, which is about white nationalism, which is about Islamophobia, which is about anti-black racism, um, which, and which is about xenophobia. Um, and particularly as it has to do with racialized um, refugee claimants. And increasingly, our refugee claimants are going to be people from the global south, um, and they will be racialized. And so I think as a country, this is certainly something we have to grapple with. Unfortunately, in Ontario, we have a government who wants no, um, nothing to do with this. Um, we were finally, after many years of advocating as part of a coalition I belong to, Color of Poverty, Color of Change. We finally had an anti-racism act passed in Ontario with the creation of an anti-racism directorate. Um, the new government came in, the Ford government came in, eliminated all um, community oversight of that and moved the directorate to the Ministry of Corrections. So that tells you what it is that we are facing in Ontario in terms of expecting any sort of support from the government in pushing back um, around some of the increasing um, rhetoric we're seeing um, that's bordering on hate. 
I'll stop there. Thank you, Debbie, and, and thank you in particular for drawing a link with the uh, Indigenous uh, Reconciliation Agenda. I think we're, we're seeing as a country that these, these issues are not only receiving more attention, but they're also becoming issues that go beyond the, the Indigenous sector mm -hmm. uh, as such, if indeed one can call it that. Um, and it may seem a small thing to change the language of the Citizenship Act, but through a number of gestures like that, Canada is uh, recognizing its history and recognizing the need to um, uh, not only try to compensate for the past, but to, to improve going, going forward. Uh, as I mentioned, Mireille Paquette was going to be on this panel, and she was going to talk particularly about Quebec. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes now. Uh, I'm not the expert that Mireille is on these questions, but uh, I did not fall from the moon uh, last week. Uh, just a couple of points about what the Coalition Avenir Quebec government is doing. Uh, as you heard, for those of you who are not aware, uh, earlier in the day, uh, the government is committed to reduce immigration to Quebec by uh, about 20%, which would be about 10,000 of the, the immigrants selected by Quebec. Uh, and it also wants to ensure or try to ensure knowledge of French and of uh, Quebec values, whatever those might be. Um, in the election platform, the uh, CAC uh, made uh, or called for knowledge of French to be a criterion for selection. Quebec gives what's called a certificate of selection, and then the federal government gives its final go-ahead. In the legislation that was put down a few weeks ago, Bill 9, um, that's been softened, and uh, uh, the uh, immigration um, candidate, uh, uh, one successful is committed to uh, learning French and also to learning about Quebec values. How this is going to be determined or tested, I suppose, will be left to uh, people in, in operations. The other thing that has happened that has somewhat knocked the government off course is that in the bill, it uh, provided for a change in the way immigrants to Quebec were selected. Quebec plans to, and this was being organized under the Liberal government, to follow more or less what the federal government introduced about three or four years ago, which is called express entry. Not sure who invented that term, but uh, we'll just pass over that. Uh, the Quebec one is going to be called Arima, uh, and uh, I think that means uh, it's taken from the verb arime, which is to match uh, uh, something with something else, uh, in stated in general terms. And the idea is to match uh, candidates for immigration with the needs of employers, which is essentially the the way the federal system operates. If a person passes the basic criteria in the point system and so on, he or she is put into a pool, and employers can. Go go into the pool and draw out the person's application. The legislation provides for all the applications in the pipeline, in other words, the ones that haven't been adjudicated, to be abolished. And what the Quebec government did was uh, within, I'm not sure whether it was before or after, someone may be able to correct me, but uh, the bill is before the National Assembly, there have been some hearings, but well before even the hearings took place, uh, the Quebec government announced that it was going to eliminate all these applications without the bill actually being passed. A number of groups got together, took this to court, and the Superior Court issued an injunction saying, you can't do this until you have legislative authorization, and the injunction has been extended. The Quebec government has essentially accepted. It would be rather foolish uh, of it to, to say to the Superior Court, we, own, we won't actually obey what you've decided. So something that was meant to be a bit of an administrative matter, although, um, uh, 
you know, uh, erasing 18,000 applications is hard, hardly a small administrative matter, but it has um, complicated, I think they wanted this legislation passed rather quickly, uh, and then there will be a separate bill. I don't want to get into the headdress issue. If you want to ask me questions about it, uh, anybody who doesn't know me uh, uh, will not be surprised where I stand, but uh, I'll just now move into the discussion period. And I'm going to do something a little different from one of the other mod all the other moderators, uh, the two this morning, which is to group uh, your questions or comments from two or three people, which means that I'm hoping that two or three people are ready to uh, help me out and the panel. There's a hand over there. So take notes. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Charles Choi. I'm a second year university student at McGill, uh, studying Canadian studies. Um, I wanted to ask a question to both panelists and wondered what your thoughts on the immigration crisis and the um, uh, border crossings are, um, because a lot of immigrants who come to Canada also have a um, stance, opponent, opponent, opposing stance on these um, immigration um, asylum seekers who go through the border or refugees and mostly are a negative stance. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Could I just challenge you for two seconds? Why is it that um, uh, a lot of people in the immigrant community... That, that's the conversation we're going to have. Okay, okay, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We need a moderator. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Sorry. Yeah, I've got to... Uh, okay, I'll bear in mind where I'm sitting. Uh, another question or comment? Okay. Um, just a to pick up on one uh, small comment that Rob made about the nature of uh, the immigration uh, field as something that has historically been more collaborative than intention between federal and provincial governments. Uh, there's clearly tension or potential tension with Quebec, Ontario, a number of other provinces now, from what I've uh, heard. Are these tensions um, political or partisan, or are they structural? Okay, uh, number three. Thank you, Graham. Graham Fraser, I'm wondering if in your analysis of the uh, debates, the tensions that exist over immigration, to what extent, in addition to these being um, federal provincial tensions, are they rural urban tensions in which the dynamic of immigration to, in many cases, the absence of immigration or the short-term nature of immigrants who stay only a very short time in areas that have sought to sponsor them or to, to hire them, um, to what extent often uh, those areas, I think uh, Professor Schwitzer refer, uh, alluded to this, it's often those areas that don't have any immigrants that are the most suspicious of immigrants. And I'm wondering to what extent that is a political dynamic that, that is shaping the, uh, the debate. Debbie, would you like to go? Yes, um, let me start with the question around um, immigration crisis. I don't think we have an immigration crisis um, in Canada. Um, as you've heard, uh, yes, we've seen an increase in irregular border crossers since the Trump regime. Um, and that's because we have uh, something called the safe cut third country agreement um, with the U.S. And so folks know that if they presented at a regular border post, they would be sent back to the U.S. It's, um, we were particularly concerned um, that the federal government was not willing to suspend the agreement, especially after the, after the Trump government decided that they would no, rec no longer recognize um, domestic violence as grounds for asylum. And so putting many refugee uh, claimant women um, at risk. And so people are, are risking life and limb to cross um, irregularly. You're absolutely um, right in terms of some of the responses from 
immigrant communities themselves. Um, I think that like the rest of us in Canada, there's a complete misunderstanding of how our various immigration categories and, and how immigration works. And so for example, I'm constantly telling people there is no queue for refugee claimants, right? Asylum seekers seek asylum because they are in need um, of protection. And we have a robust system that takes you know four or five years because of a lack of resources um, for people to go through the system. But if you're a failed claimant, you're removed from Canada. And unfortunately, well, you know, I, I have a different take on that. But as you've heard, the government is certainly putting a hell of a lot of money into it. Um, for example, in, in Toronto, where we've seen um, the, probably the most outspoken um, anti-regular arrivals has been in the Chinese community in Markham, um, Ontario, who held a rally against this. And so there's much um, education for us to do within, uh, the, within immigrant communities um, themselves. Uh, in, in terms of, I'm going to leave that second question to you in terms of the immigration field. Um, debates and tensions with smaller centers, yes, but I must tell you that um, the, one of the reasons that the federal government recently announced their small rural and northern uh, pilot outside of Atlantic Canada, it's, it is because of interest from smaller and rural areas. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I was out in New Brunswick and there was, um, I, and I was moderating a panel of small center mayors and there were communities of 1,000 people, little fishing village, who were looking to bring in um, immigrants, um, recognizing that it's a demographic imperative. Uh, in Northern Ontario, I was in Sudbury last week to talk about the pilot and the kinds of things that communities need to be doing um, to create welcoming spaces, because they, they're they have jobs that are going wanting, and so are wanting to attract immigrants, and not only wanting them to come, um, but wanting them to come and stay. And so I think there's a real change that's happening, um, but, but those of us who work in the field, as well as our media, um, have an important role to play in terms of talking about the benefits of immigration and countering some of the negative uh, rhetoric we've been hearing, um, including the misinformation that's being put out by some of our politicians. Um, I, I think that in the next decade or so, we are going to see a very different relationship between smaller centers and the conversation around immigration. Um, it's interesting because I have a meeting coming up with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, which are made up of smaller centers, um, and they're absolutely wanting to engage around Im issues of immigration. So, I, you took all my responses to the first question. I wrote down <laughs> immigration crisis. So, um, crisis is one way to look at it and one way to frame it, right? And it's a particular way that puts it into a lens that it is a crisis that requires some sort of extraordinary response. There, I, I think the number one thing I say when I talk to anyone about immigration these days is there's no queue at all. It doesn't exist. There's no queue to jump. There's no way in which that stresses a system to have people coming through different channels. There's stress in processing refugee status determination for the individuals who have crossed and sought asylum. So there is stress there that requires resources and time and offices that were closed have to be reopened and resources put in and ways to, to try and lessen the burden on both the migrant, the communities in which they're in, and the government's trying to do this, mainly the migrant there. And, but there's no queue. So when individuals cross and seek asylum, that doesn't take, there's no, the pie expands in that extent. There is no closed pie that then it, every asylum seeker that comes, we lose one economic migrant. It doesn't work that way at all. And that's actually part and parcel of the problem of trying to explain this, it's very complex. Even within the humanitarian stream, there's different streams, right, and different refugees that we resettle ourselves, government selected and private selected. Um, so that is, you know, the one kind of side of this. In terms of you said, uh, so that's all the not, right? The is is we have a, obligations under UN conventions and as humans, humans who are decent to try and actually and, and help this system work to actually help these people who are fleeing persecution and trying to resettle them into successful communities. So, you know, I really always push back hard against the crisis label and against, as Leslie said, it's hard if it's irregular or illegal or a border cross or asylum seeker or refugee status uh, seeker. Mm -hmm. These are very difficult uh, and they're all value laden comments. So that's, you know, my quick take on Martana's question, which is very good, is the collaboration we've seen in immigration historically over the last 25 years and the turn to tension, is this political or is it structural? So ironically, I don't think it's political. So I don't just think it's that we have a lack of political affiliation between the premiers and the prime minister currently, with the conflict coming from two, from, uh, from Ford and from Legault and Trudeau all coming from different political stripes and different perspectives. I actually think, you know, one of the things I say is, 
we saw some of the largest expansion of collaboration under the, prim the prime ministership of Stephen Harper in the immigration field. Stephen Harper was not known for collaborating with anyone or with his provincial counterparts. He, and he had a specific view about immigration's role in our system. And yet we saw under that in a massive expansion of multilateral collaboration where we had a joint vision for the immigration system signed between all of the provinces, with Quebec also signing, but saying it would be slightly different and the accord regulates its relationship. Uh, and, um, uh, and really working hard to develop, the, I think, the most significant reform to our immigration system since the advent of the human capital model under express entry, terrible name, but a complete shift in how we select uh, economic migrants, right? Uh, it was a massive shift, and the provinces had a major role in it. So we saw that under a conservative prime minister who didn't want to work with everybody, and, and liberal premiers largely, and today we see a liberal, a liberal prime minister who wants to work and conservative prime, uh, premiers who don't. And I think that here, the issue is not partisan, it's structural. And it's in the humanitarian side, the provinces haven't had a role in selecting or managing the policies related to refugee status termination, asylum seekers. That's always been understood to be a federal uh, grounds, and so they don't have buy-in. And so they don't have anything constraining them from taking pot shots or not wanting Doug Ford saying, this is not my area, I don't want to play. If Doug Ford and the Ontario government for the last 20 years have been playing a significant role in refugee status determination and policy, it would be a much harder thing to say the feds are doing a bad job here. Right? So this is, I think, where how this policy field has developed over time, where the provinces haven't played, and I think it will change over time. But I think that's actually a good example of where it does become political is in the humanitarian field, because we saw with the bringing in of the Syrian refugees, one of the mm. reasons that it was so successful is because the Ontario government stepped out ahead of the federal government yeah. in terms of ensuring that their resources and coordination was happening on the ground. So by the time the Syrians got to Ontario, we were ready, mm. right, as, as a sector, where um, the municipal had been aligned, the mm. sector organizations, the faith communities, the private sponsors, all of that coordination was happening, and the provincial government put money into the system while we were still waiting on the federal government to determine how much money is going to put in after they had made this huge election promise to bring in all of these people. Mm. Yeah. So, so maybe what I'll say is it's not, not political, because I think it is. On to the, the third question really mm -hmm. quick. It's not partisan political, I don't think, it's entirely here. Yes. I don't think it's just that quickly. And the final question, which is a great one, mm -hmm. I'm just, I think the rural-urban divide is extremely important here. So, and rural urban has been a long-standing divide in immigration, important in the whole entire advent of the provincial nominee program and giving provinces a role in selecting was to provincialize and actually try and move the benefits of immigration outside of Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. And it has been somewhat successful in that. There's great success stories of Steinbeck, Manitoba being, you know, the, the pinnacle of how one integrates migrants into a community in such a way that everyone wins and it works out very well. Uh, but the reality is here, and this is really important, is that that's on the economic side, where good immigrants are coming in and staying in the community, and the humanitarian side is racialized, and yeah. it is anti-migrant, uh, anti-Islam. It is a significant problem that that is actually what's raising the crisis specter. And there is a divide there between communities who have exposure to migrants coming from diverse source countries and those that don't, right? And there's a big, there's a big divide there in the understanding. And political actors playing those cards. I agree with you, yeah. In response to Graham, I just want to mention a, a bit of research that, that may be of interest um, on the question of city, uh, rural-urban divide. Antoine Bilodeau and, and a couple of his colleagues uh, uh, did a study. It was a, a new survey, large, a large sample in Quebec. And they were focusing not so much on immigration levels, but on uh, issues with, with integration, including restrictions on religious dress and so on, where they found the highest level of opposition was not, in, uh, not on the island of Montreal, where the concentration is the highest, not in the rural areas of Quebec, but actually in what we call here the 450, which is the equivalent of the 905. So uh, the municipalities on the South Shore and Laval and others on the North Shore. Their, their explanation for that, briefly stated, is the following, that on the island of Montreal, the concentrations are such that uh, people, people are living and interacting on a daily basis with people from a whole range of backgrounds and so on. In the rural areas, Areas, they are not, because the level of uh, immigrants, uh, which of course basically means uh, visible minorities, is uh, tiny, tiny. And in the uh, in the 450, the immigrants are there, um, 
but they're not in such a large concentration and there isn't such a long history of their being there. Um, so I just thought I'd toss that out. I don't know of comparable research, for example, in Ontario. Uh, it would be interesting to, to have that kind of research duplicated. So uh, I'm looking for another couple of questions or comments. I'm ready. You're ready? You're, you're, qu you're quite welcome to... Yeah. Okay. Um, so you mentioned how um, the Ontario government cut the immigration minister, um, and something that was very interesting in the last year is that Bill Blair was appointed minister of uh, border safety, sorry, and organized crime. Uh, in your view, is this a political response based on opposition critiques that the Liberal government wasn't doing enough to handle this so-called crisis, or is this something where we see CBSA spun off from public safety and really um, the enforcement mechanism, whether that be inland or at ports of entry, um, be strengthened under liberal governments, which really have been defined more under sunny ways and letting people in. Um, I, I think it's. I think you. You're right. I, I think it was a liberal response to the whole. This is a crisis um, uh, piece, um, and our response when um, Bill Blair was appointed, and 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 the two things were linked. So on the one hand, the liberal government was saying that irregular arrival. We have an international obligation to bring in asylum seekers. Canadian law allows folks who, as soon as they come on Canadian um, soil, to be able to claim asylum. We have the system, and then they stepped on their own message. By by appointing Bill Blair and linking organized crime to irregular border crosses, right? Um, we have a public safety minister in Ralph Goodall, who is responsible for CBSA. Um, CBSA is responsible for our borders. Why this minister without portfolio is what we called him, um, was appointed. Clearly, it was a response. Um, yesterday's budget. Same thing in terms of the increased money for CBSA, as well as a focus on a refocus on um, really pushing, uh, extending the Safe Third Country Agreement to speak to the whole border. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, it's an election year, and the Liberals are wanting to be seen to be responding to this made-up thing about crisis at the border. I, Another question, I fully agree. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but no, no, but I fully agree. The only thing I'd so the the. I heard various people say, well, Ralph Goodell was very overtaxed, and so we needed to hive this off. It's, Ralph Goodell at one point ran most of the country when he was, uh, <laughs> he was minister of everything for a while under Jean Chrétien, I, and he's a very capable minister. I don't think he couldn't handle this. In mm -hmm. fact, there's reported tensions in some of this element. I'm and, and then the other bit there is, it is it's not just... So it's not just posturing in a political sense, it is trying to cover their flank, you know, going not just into the election, but also just into the broader legitimacy for that public mm -hmm. portfolio, mm -hmm. right? So they're trying to say, we do take this seriously. And it, you know, it, it, it's, the, if you read the budget this year, and then you look at some of the communications that have come prior to it, you wouldn't think they were coming from the same government. That's right. so. While somebody's thinking up a question, I'm going to be Davos-like, and I'm going to ask one of our panelists a question. Professor Schertzer, put yourself in the mode of political advisor for just a moment. We lose. <laughs> <laughs> you gave us uh, survey data. Um, you and others have made it quite clear that this is a volatile policy area. We heard this morning that uh, from uh, Dr. Dau that this is one of the issues that could be uh, at the forefront in the federal election. If you want to appeal to your base, isn't there enough there already without uh, abolishing the immigration department? Uh, uh, kicking out the immigration minister, having no immigration minister, essentially um, uh, following an empty chair policy, which was often used by some Quebec governments in the past. When there's a federal provincial meeting, who's going who's to sit for Ontario? The director of the branch that got moved to that department and so on. So um, if you need to appeal to the base, why worry about um, machinery changes mm -hmm. and the fact that you, uh, what does it say, does it say something positive to your base uh, if you don't have an immigration minister anymore? Mm -hmm. Isn't this overkill? Well, that's a very good question. So <laughs> am I advising the, the progressive conservative, the conservative party here or the liberals to go back at them? No. Ah. I, should the been, I should have been clearer, yeah. <laughs> I should have been clearer. You were called in front of the Ford uh, transition team okay. three then, days okay. before the cabinet was announced. Okay, that's good. So, I, yeah, I think I will. I 
personally would definitely not uh, advise getting rid of the Ministry of Immigration because I have lots of friends who still work there. So, uh, but, but what I'd probably say is I think you're 100% right. I actually think those decisions probably signal some undercover views of their value of what immigration is to play in their political project in Ontario. Mm -hmm. So you make those machinery decisions usually um, based on your prioritization list and your mandates for your minister and what you want to get, right? And so for them, clearly that was not a priority. And then I, I, but I do think the, the, you know, the number of things that the premier can hold in his head at any one time at the top of the list is reduce spending in the province. And so he's made the decision element there is reduce these ministries because we can undercover cut things over time and deprioritize it. So I actually think that it is more, he's making priorities and the priorities show what his undercover view is in the value of these services. But I actually think the paradigm is save money right now and I can save it in this area. I can cut francophone universities that were promised. I can cut a funding for official language minority communities. And these, are, these show his view of his, populi of his populist base, right? And so it, it's slightly more, but I also think slightly simpler, because there's only so much that can be held there, and I think it's remove money, right, from these areas. That's what I, that's what I think. Yeah, I think so. And I would advise that would be a bad idea, just to be on the record and clear about that. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Schertz. Yeah, yeah. You just saved yourself through the last yeah. sentence. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to do Davos forever, uh, even though I probably could carry on for another 15 minutes. I'm looking for another question or comment. There must be. There must be some more. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for this discussion. Um, I'm wondering if you could go back, Leslie, to this issue of um, so the proposals that we are discussing here in Quebec, and um, and the relationship between language and immigration, because the situation here in Quebec is quite different from the one you see in uh, other provinces, um, and. Um, when we think about language issues in Quebec, it's today it's directly related to immigration in the political discourse, and it's not just CAC when you, you know, it's in the media, it's everywhere. So maybe you could tell us what's your take on this close relationship between immigration and language in Quebec to explain maybe for people uh, here who are not from Quebec, uh, you know, where it's going and, and why the, the CAQ is emphasizing this issue so much. Well, uh, Governments of, of both political stripe, uh, Liberal and PQ, have tried over decades to uh, bring up the level of, or the, the proportion of uh, people selected to come to Quebec who already have, let's just say, a working knowledge, adequate knowledge of French. And they, uh, the numbers are kind of stagnant around 55% or so. This is of principal applicants. This doesn't uh, include uh, members of the family and so on. They are not uh, part of the application process. And uh, your, your competence in French is one of the criteria on which people are evaluated. Just at the uh, federal level, it's, it's English and French. And it's not. Um, a green red light. You're not disqualified from being uh, selected as an immigrant coming to Quebec in the economic class if you don't have a working knowledge of French. As I mentioned before, in its election platform, such as it is, a few bullets, well, several bullets on the website, uh, the CAQ wanted to make knowledge, adequate knowledge of French a criterion for selection. They have not gone that far. They've gone, what they're doing is the following. They're, they're putting language together with integration, which of course makes sense. And they see it as part of a, a kind of a mutual contract between uh, an immigrant and Quebec society. And I'll just do a translation on the spot here. On the one hand, uh, the Quebec society must be welcoming and inclusive, and the government has responsibility to put in place uh, services uh, that are effective and, and tailored to immigrants in the areas of French, uh, um, French knowledge, francisation, uh, and immigration, or sorry, integration. And this is key. The immigrant for his or her part, must commit to uh, uh, doing uh, enough uh, 
to settle in and integration, including learning French and the democratic values of Quebec as expressed in the Charter of uh, Rights and Freedoms. Uh, that's the Quebec Charter they're referring to. The, the rights and freedoms in the Quebec Charter are almost identical to the ones in the Federal Charter, um, all of which are drawn basically from the UN Declaration. Quebec's charter is actually older than the Federal one. It dates from 1975. So as I mentioned earlier, how that's going to be uh, implemented is, is uh, is uh, not clear, but uh, they probably decided um, two things. If they were going to make it a criterion for selection, uh, they were going to have even more difficulty attracting people to come to Quebec. And secondly, uh, to the degree that they may have thought about some kind of negotiation with Ottawa, uh, they, might have, they might have assessed it as being an undue obstacle. Um, it in many ways uh, is, is at the heart of the debate here in Quebec. Uh, it's not just about uh, whether or not people should wear a piece of cloth on their head or have the right to wear a piece of cloth on their head or not. It's also about, uh, about people's capacity to work in French. And of course, the, the legislation from the 1970s uh, uh, has tried to uh, make French more of a working language, but applies only to businesses that have 50 or more employees. So there are constant comments about the fact that if you go into a shop on St. Catherine Street in the heart of the city, uh, you might get a bonjour high, but it breaks down after that. Uh, you, you won't get service in French, or if you do, it's really r rather weak. So, um, you know, this is this is an area that's going to continue to be really important, really central in Quebec. And I think it's unfortunate that two other important things get forgotten along the way. The one is the incredibly close link between language knowledge, in this case French, and your integration in the workforce. Uh, and the second, about which the uh, CAQ has nothing to say, nor the Ford government, which is our continuing huge problem in this country of recognizing foreign credentials. People are still coming to Canada and having to wait five, seven years, take extra training, uh, meet all kinds of tests and so on. And in some cases, professional societies have actually made these more difficult rather than less difficult. Now, uh, the nurses in Ontario are uh, a cardinal example. Nurses play an important role, of course they do, but uh, suggesting that people who come with a degree from one of the universities or the colleges in the Philippines are not able to do most of what a nurse can do on a daily basis seems to me to be uh, a stretch and also to work uh, completely against uh, the conditions of the labor market, which is a huge sh shortage in this sector. Same thing, of course, for Quebec. Uh, huge shortages in the labor markets, as I mentioned earlier, business organizations saying we need more, not fewer immigrants, yet you have a government that is for the first time, a mainstream party campaigned on reducing the numbers of immigrants coming to a province or indeed to the country as a whole. We now have, uh, to use uh, Martin Papillon's term, we now have Mad Max campaigning at the federal level for a reduction. He doesn't actually say how many, but uh, we have moved into another world because in Quebec and to a lesser degree in the rest of Canada, it's largely integration issues that have been at the forefront. But we're now at a stage where, and in partly because of the irregular border crossers, the actual numbers are becoming an issue and the openness to the existing level or to an increased level of immigration, which is the government's policy, the openness has, has been dropping somewhat, which is, uh, um, I think, really quite worrying because there is a distinction that can be drawn between integration and the actual numbers. You can be doing okay on the, the numbers, which I think we've been doing over the last decades and so on. You can be doing less well on the integration side. Uh, and um, th my final word on this would be by abolishing a Minister of Immigration who has a program of uh, um, millions of dollars for integration in Ontario. 
does not make sense. It absolutely does not make sense. Did I stimulate anybody to I'm ask hoping, another? The one thing I'm hoping with the Quebec situation is if they are to open the accord, then we, those of us from outside Quebec will have a say in terms of the fact that Quebec gets funded regardless of what its numbers are. So in fact, Quebec has, gets more funding than Ontario for immigration, in spite of the fact that Ontario receives almost three times the amount of immigrants that Quebec does. Well, That's my... If they come to my if they come to my door, which of course they won't, <laughs> uh, to ask whether they should open me a court, I will simply say no. Well, they would be smart not to. I made a, a <laughs> passing just really quickly that it was illogical because the federal government for years has loved to have a re just, just get just even have them in the room and have, say the word accord and not have people walk out of the room, right? So that it would it would just be completely illogical to to have to open up the discussion. So which is probably why you're seeing some of the pullback. From, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, not going to, I'm not going to beat our, our, our participants here. up. Is, is there somebody? Yeah. Oh, good, good. Yes, okay. Jean-Marc Fournier. Uh, vous avez demandé ceux qui avaient été stimulés par votre intervention. Alors, comme je l'ai été, je vais, je vais vous dire un petit mot sur euh, l'interprétation que j'ai du sentiment au Québec sur la question, euh, notamment, est-ce que c'est politique ou structurel? Euh, c'est clairement politique et c'est clairement politique partisan. Euh, D'une part, ce n'est pas étonnant, parce que ça se fait au Québec, comme ailleurs au Canada, comme un peu partout dans le monde, dans la définition identitaire qui se définit beaucoup par l'autre, l'autre étant le, le nouvel arrivant. Euh, la question linguistique qui a été posée un peu plus tôt, à mon avis, ne se pose plus. À 94.8, euh, et les jeunes euh, ne répondant plus à la, à la crise des années 60, 70 et avant. Là. Alors, le français est moins la, la donnée de définition identitaire, et c'est beaucoup plus la question de, de l'immigration. Euh, et, et forcément, euh, ce que la CAQ a fait, c'est d'utiliser deux volets, celui de la diminution du nombre d'immigrants pour répondre à la crainte euh, de la population, qui est moindre ici au Québec, qu'ailleurs au Canada. Euh, il faut bien réaliser qu'à part l'Atlantique, qui craint un peu moins, au, au Québec, je pense que les chiffres, c'est 43 qui disent qu'il y a trop d'immigrants. En Ontario, à 44, dans l'Ouest, à 50 68 de la base du Parti conservateur croit qu'il y a trop d'immigrants. Il n'y a pas de doute que la campagne électorale va se faire sur la question de trop d'immigrants, la question qu'on a eue au Québec ici. Mais on n'est pas dans une dimension linguistique, on est dans une, dans une dimension qui se vit partout ailleurs, à savoir l'autre. Et l'autre, on, euh, on le définit euh, un peu n'importe comment. Vous avez soulevé une, tantôt une question entre les réfugiés et l'immigration. Je pense que ce n'est pas si clair que ça pour les citoyens. Euh, pour eux, euh, tous ceux qui arrivent, peu importe comment ils arrivent, euh, ça les inquiète. Et, et, et la difficulté vient du fait que... Euh, on a besoin d'immigration, on en veut, mais il faut quand même considérer qu'il y a une crainte, il faut trouver de la manière d'y répondre à cette crainte-là. Et là, c'est pour, pour ça que des panels comme ceux-ci sont importants, mais une fois que vous allez avoir terminé le panel, ce sera important que vous participiez à faire la pédagogie de la population. Je crois qu'on a besoin de plus en plus d'académiques dans la politique. Parce que si on laisse ça qu'à des politiciens, j'en connais quelques-uns, euh, <rire> peut-être que ce n'est pas la meilleure solution. Alors, je, je crois que vous devriez prendre la parole publique un peu plus souvent. Merci. Merci beaucoup de, de vos observations. Et euh, euh, je suis certain que les organisateurs sont contents de votre présence ici aujourd'hui. Euh, This will be the last, uh, now everybody's coming in, of course. Uh, this will be the last uh, question or comment. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Krista Schultz. I'm with MISC and the Political Science Department. Um, I, I think this is an unfair question. Um, those are the best ones, I think. <laughs> Out the door. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Western Canada. My family's an immigrant family. Uh, but I'm also thinking back to when I was a teenager in the you know, 80s, 70s and 80s, and I think about the Vietnamese boat people. Um, and it seems to me that there we had a very similar situation in terms of lots of people coming, or at least the, the potential of, of a framing of crisis, but it seems to me, and that may be the rosy part, that we did better somehow in that time. We responded better. So my question is, is that true? Is there something we can learn from our own experiences uh, in that particular moment to reflect on today? Um, are there any lessons that we can learn from how Canada responded to an immigration situation that in some ways I think is similar? <laughs> 
Thank you for that, uh, that question. Uh, could each of you respond, like, literally a minute? Because uh, we don't want to squeeze the other panel. Uh, I, um, thanks for referencing the Indo-Chinese um, movement. I, but I think, um, as Canadians, we responded similarly with the Syrian resettlement. Um, we saw a complete, we had folks coming into um, the sector, um, renting homes, wanting to sponsor families, you know, and lots of tensions erupted um, there as well. But um, I, I think, as Canadians, um, we, the sense I'm getting is that Canadians are fine if they think we've chosen you. Um, they have problems with people who they think are walking across our border. Um, I also think that Canadians identified with Syrians because they're light skin, um, as opposed to the folks who are crossing our border who tends to be from Africa and or from Latin America, and so are indigenous um, and or mixed race or darker skin. Um, I, I do think we need to pay attention to the role that race and racism is playing in some of the anti-immigrant um, rhetoric that we're hearing. Um, I, I completely agree with you. I think I don't think the regular Canadian on the street um, knows the difference between a refugee, a refugee claimant, an immigrant, or it matters to them what they see or who is coming in. And some people are more um, acceptable th than others, right? Our immigration laws you know, used to be just as racist. So yes, I think um, it's the controlled element, right? And yes, like the issue here is there's a lack of understanding about what's controlled and not controlled, and it's scary for everybody, mm -hmm. right? And so it's partisan politics mixing with ethno-nationalism, mixing with urban-rural, and there's all kinds of things, and we're in a dangerous time. So we'll end on that note, I yeah. think. Um, but I agree, public education <laughs> is, the way, is the way to go, I think, especially in this year as we head into a federal election and, we're, and we, we saw the Yellow Vest um, right. movement here in Canada. We, we know that politically some folks will be situating themselves there as a way of um, dog whistling to a particular mm -hmm. constituents group. Um, public education is, is the way to go and something we're planning to work and, on. And something we haven't, yeah. so on the Gilets Jaunes, uh, on the convoy, they're saying it's about jobs and not about climate change and on the side of the leading truck says no to UN migration pact. That's right. Right, c'est très clair. It cannot be clearer about what the message is, right? So anyway, yeah, we didn't again, see on that positive note. note. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving him the last word which he wants. No, no, no. <laughs> um, thank you to uh, both our panelists.